welcome everyone. This is our second talk of the semester. Uh, this event is co-hosted by the Plurilingual uh, Lab Speaker Series, as well as DICE uh, Research Talks, and also the uh, Belonging, uh, Identity, Language and Diversity Research Group. Uh, so today we're really, well, we're really happy to welcome Dr. Uh, Saskia Van Vigit from York University. So today uh, she's going to talk about her research that took place in a school setting, looking at migrant as well as uh, 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 students' experiences that have been forced, uh, experienced forced displacement or migration. Um, and she's going to be looking at the way that they engaged in using different semiotic resources, uh, different uh, fluid mixing of languages, as well as different modes of communication for their learning. So today, Dr. Uh, Van Vegen will have one hour for her talk, which will be followed by a 30-minute discussion period. Uh, the talk will be uh, video recorded, uh, and the recording will be available on the uh, Plurilingual Lab uh, YouTube channel. However, the discussion period won't be video, video recorded so that everybody feels comfortable to you know, share as much as they want to. And uh, we will also be taking pictures today, so please let, let us know if you're not comfortable with us uh, taking your picture. Thank you. Enjoy. Bonjour, merci beaucoup, Angelica, pour l'invitation d'être ici. Je suis très heureuse de uh, share my work with you and to meet students from McGill and see old friends um, and connect and talk about some research that I've been doing with youth at the secondary level who are resettling in the Ontario context and um, to talk a little bit about my collaboration with educators at their school to develop pedagogies to meet their needs. So. Um, while I'm talking, we can have a bit of an informal environment. If there are particular questions or things you want to ask about along the way, feel free. And if not, uh, save your questions to the end. So, um, The title for my talk, Roots and Roots to Belonging and Participation, Translanguaging as Pedagogy with Youth from Refugee Backgrounds, um, and actually, you know what, Angelica, it would be good if I can see this, at least the slides, so I don't turn. I wonder if I can just... I think this will extend over there at all. Just so I know what I'm talking about. If I forget, I'll turn around. Um, I, I chose this idea of roots and roots because it... <coughs> symbolizes for me a bit of a paradox and a struggle that's going on in the field of applied linguistics right now when we think about what is language and the way language and constructs of language are being contested, particularly between monolingual paradigms and multilingual um, understandings of language and languaging. And so what I how I think about this these days is that some of these theoretical concepts and ideas are sitting uncomfortably against the material realities of what learners are engaging with in their classrooms, particularly uh, learners who have been forcibly displaced from their countries of origin. And for them, the material reality of um, acquiring a new language and using a new language um, is something that is very important to their resettlement because um, they don't necessarily have a, a home to return to at the present moment or that may be a temporary or permanent situation, but it is something that nonetheless they are dealing with in their everyday lives. So how do we think about that and the need to um, learn a new language, a socially constructed named language, while at the same time recognizing the ways in which we think about language are changing, um, especially from a critical perspective. And so I'm also thinking a lot about um, belonging and participation. And in, in thinking about the way these youth use language in their classrooms, it's very central to the project and to our uh, collaboration 
that we are supporting them in feeling and developing a sense of belonging and creating opportunities for participation that are the same as their same age peers in the classroom. So again, even when we're comparing students, we're not necessarily comparing you know, so-called native speaking students or um, English speaking students, but really looking at these youth in relation to their same age peers, because that is what should be the um, bars, that they're able to participate in the same ways as others in their school. Um, so that's, these are the things I like to think about these days. And to me that matters a lot more than other ideas about achievement and improvement and progress, but um, that these are guiding the kind of work that we do. So um, what I'm hoping to do is first I'll talk a little bit about, a little bit more about these theoretical perspectives that are guiding uh, my work these days, and then I'm going to present some findings from an empirical project that I'm involved with with some other researchers across Canada, and I'll share the analytic lens that I'm using to look at the data that uh, we've been gathering, and we'll, look, we'll dig deep into some of the data. I'm very excited to share that with you and to hear your thoughts and perspectives. Um, but of course, when Thinking about this project and thinking about the youth that we are working with, when we're in schools, it's very common that the, identi the um, identities of these youth are sometimes described as refugee students or refugees. And this concept, this, this label of refugee, we have found is standing in for a lot of ideas about who these students are, almost the same way as we might here in schools about, well, at least in the Ontario context, students are identified as English language learners. So I like to use this language of identified as, and who is doing that identifying? So in many cases, the word refugee, this is an identification by governments, by state institutions that are putting these labels on people, but really we're just talking about youth. We're talking about young people, we're talking about learners, we're talking about children. And um, this is a, a label that is starting to stand in for other identifiers. And it's becoming loaded in many different ways. Um, so thinking about what does that terminology mean for us and how do we um, wrestle with that. And also, in, I should mention, in Ontario, in schools, the students are also identified sometimes as um, ELD students. So ELD means English for Literacy Development, and it is actually the name of a program that is designed for students who have had gaps in their formal schooling or they have had limited prior schooling. So it is a program name, but sometimes the label gets uh, pushed on to students as well, so they become ELD students. But what I like to do is following, um, I think it's even in APA guidelines, to always put the person before the adjective, so that we're talking about youth from refugee backgrounds, youth who have been displaced, rather than displaced youth, or migrant youth, or refugee youth. Um, it's hard to make that change sometimes, and I might accidentally do that while I'm talking, but I just like to think about the fact that people are more than their migration status. And this comes from, uh, at York University where I work, I'm affiliated with the Center for Refugee Studies, and this is a manifesto that has been written there by uh, several researchers. Am I still in meeting the, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I, I love what it says about um, taking the time to listen to individual narratives and collective stories and supporting people's livelihood strategies and expanding opportunities for those who are excluded to recenter local ways of knowing and doing. And I see language as central to this effort. So um, in this talk, I'll talk about how we are supporting these youth in school to um, expand their opportunities for participation. But in doing so, we have seen the ways in which educators and the youth themselves are bringing their translanguaging practice into the classroom and shifting the ways in which um, education happens in their translanguaging classrooms, if we might want to call it that. 
The question that I decided to settle on for today, although this is not one of our official research questions, we have other research questions, but today I thought I would think about what comprises pedagogy to support social and educational integration of children and youth who have experienced forced displacement and migration. Um, and also, maybe I, I'm posing this question today, but I think it's also because the research questions for me in our study are changing a little bit. Um, I like to do collaborative work and participatory work as much as possible with uh, educators and with, with students in classrooms and to develop research questions once I'm there. But of course we all know how um, the process of um, entering into the field works and, and um, getting ethical approval for particular research. You have to have research questions in advance. So those ones were more about language and literacy practices. What are the language and literacy practices of these youth in, in schools? Uh, but now this is a question that I'm thinking more about. So when we're talking about um, youth who have been displaced, who are they? What, are, what do we know uh, presently in, in the world right now? I, I just looked at some um, statistics from the UN um, HCR, which shows that among those who have been displaced globally, um, enrollment in primary schools is reported to be, and I'll say reported to be, uh, 63%, and which is good, but it's, it's far too low. And what is particularly concerning is look at the secondary school enrollment, the huge difference, 24% of youth who have been displaced are in school. And when we think about schooling and education as um, a pathway to uh, future educational opportunities and forms of participation, that is a staggering number. And Canada, the Canadian model for welcoming refugees has been upheld as a global model. But we need to think about what are their experiences before they come uh, to our context. And this is, when you think about how many students may have uh, not been in school for several years before they come, um, how do we think about that and, and how do we address that? Uh, and from the UNHCR document, they also discuss how displacement disrupts education because of dangers relating to safety, accessing resources, acquiring identity documents, and helping their families in often vulnerable situations. Yes? No, not necessarily in host countries, but globally. This is from a UN report on the status of refugees in, in the world, and um, it is what it what the UN has collected as reported data about um, enrollment in any context. In, particularly perhaps in refugee camps. I, I'm not sure um, where... Internal displacement. It could be, yeah. um, but it's not necessarily in host countries. And certainly in the Canadian context, th these are not the numbers in Canada at all. I would say hopefully we have 100% enrollment, but to think about what does it mean, because when we talk about um, gaps in prior schooling, or gaps in formal education, or limited prior schooling. Well, what does that look like? Well, this is a significant gap. And then I included this picture from um, one of the students that I've been working with, because then when we think about what does this gap look like when I'm working with a 16-year-old? Um, here, um, from this student who has um, not been in school ever, um, this is the work that he is doing now, and he taught himself to read Arabic and um, now he's learning English in school as well and so that just he's 16 and he has incredible drive and interest in learning and uh, reading and writing and these these are some of his efforts but you know again when we're talking about comparing to same age peers um, this is a concern and the other reason um, that we are focusing on youth at the secondary level for this particular project is because when youth arrive, they have a very short period of time by which to accumulate sufficient credits for graduation. 
So if you arrive to Canada at 15, 16, 17 years old, you have you know, one, two, or three years to graduate from high school and to learn as much as you can in that context, with, which is age appropriate, um, with a lot of support, well-resourced schools, um, but time is running out. Versus for a child who comes at six, seven, eight years old, we can hope that they have you know, many years ahead of them uh, to catch up to their same age peers. So the pressure to support um, students like this particular student is heavy, I think, on educators and on all of us. Um, so, also, not only in thinking about the context, but thinking about students' identities, uh, one of the things that I'm pulling upon here is, this is um, from an article written by, co-authored co by a scholar and um, a person who has been a, a refugee, and she's writing about her experience um, as a refugee, and I thought what she wrote is particularly salient for the work that, that I'm doing and interested in, and particularly as it rubs up against how we are thinking about language in applied linguistics or educational linguistics. And I love the things that she has said, that um, I'm simultaneously from here and there, of course, um, and she feels that her experience in Canada of being multi exempts me from being only. And also, in talking about her Cubania, her Mexicanidad, and her Canadianship, all coming in waves all at once, it's difficult to find where one ends and the other begins. And when I read this, I immediately was thinking about how nicely this echoed the kinds of things that we are talking about when we are thinking about translanguaging practice, translanguaging pedagogies, and how we are theorizing language as one dynamic, integrated linguistic repertoire that we draw upon when we communicate in uh, named languages. So this, this one and many existing all at once. And that I, I know in our field we, we have a lot of debate around um, how we are talking about language and can you write about language. Or are we just writing about second order named languages versus first order languaging in the mind? And I think um, hearing what this, this um, person has written helps to say, helps to provide a rationale for why we're thinking language otherwise. And this informs how I'm working with students. So when we're thinking about language in that way, I, I took this picture. Some of you have been at York University. Uh, this is uh, in one of the major hallways leading up to my office. It's not attributed, unfortunately, and it is a picture of a tree upside down. So again, this speaks to me about how we are rethinking what is language and rethinking what are roots and roots, pathways, and having a more dynamic perspective around what language is. Now, I'm assuming um, that we've all hopefully or perhaps heard about what is translanguaging, how has it been defined, who is defining it, and so on. So I won't go into too much detail, but we can talk more about that. But some perspectives that I wanted to draw upon here are thinking, first of all, of translanguaging theory and language as action, as languaging, and as situated enactment and dynamic use of semiotic resources according to social context, interlocutors, and communicative aims. That we are always shifting and shuttling and moving and meshing our languages and drawing upon our repertoires depending on the context, the social context. And also drawing on um, some writing that Li Wei has done recently around translanguaging instinct. I found this, when I read this, um, and I think it was published not too long ago, oh, maybe 2017, um, or I reread it, it really reminded me of the students that I saw in the classrooms where I was working. So that I'm not just talking about translanguaging practice and language use, but also this instinct, this incredible drive working with these youth who are so eager to communicate who they are, what they're thinking, and what they have to offer in the classroom, that it is like this instinct and drive. Uh, that they are combining any and all resources at their disposal to promote their own learning and their own agency. 
And then thinking about translanguaging spaces, uh, particularly classrooms, and, and starting to think about translanguaging classrooms. What is a translanguaging classroom? To me, and uh, drawing upon the work of others who I've cited here, um, a translanguaging space is where um, this kind of language practice, this kind of multilingual language use is welcome, it's seen obviously as legitimate, um, it is unrestricted, no one is putting boundaries on what and how people may use their language, and also for classrooms in particular it is strategic because in classrooms we are always planning we are purposeful in what we teach. We think about why we are doing what we're doing with students. And so it, the translanguaging then needs to be strategic. So these, this is how I'm thinking about translanguaging today. Um, the project that the data uh, draws upon is led by my colleague Maureen Kendrick from the University of British Columbia. She's the PI. Uh, along with more Margaret Early and Shelley Taylor from Western University. And the, the project is called Language and Literacy Learning Among Youth Refugees in Canadian Secondary School Classrooms. And we are in the third year of a four-year study. So it's been wonderful. It's been a lot of great work with a lot of great students helping us too. This sign is from uh, one of the classrooms. Uh, I just took a picture of the sign that the teacher had welcoming us to the classroom. Here are the purposes of that empirical study, to help education systems and community groups understand how to support youth from refugee backgrounds. And to support these youth, um, especially in working with some of the challenges that they have in their, and are experiencing in their lives, any barriers to learning or social adjustment or academic success, so trying to understand and work with them in the present moment to um, overcome some of these barriers. And certainly when we are gathering this research and doing this field work, we are in the classroom working. It, I think it's almost impossible as an educator to enter one of these classrooms with uh, youth from refugee backgrounds and not be there to be helping. You, there's no point. You might as well not even come. You have to be involved and sitting always with someone, working, helping. Um, it's, you're, so you're doing both at the same time. You're gather, gathering data, hanging out, but also working on language and literacy and you're teaching all the time. Um, and also, we are interested in developing innovative policies and pedagogic practices, very much informed by what we are seeing these educators do. Uh, these, the teachers that we are working with are not necessarily trained or have particular experience working with um, people who have been displaced, forcibly displaced, but they are incredible at coming up with and drawing upon the, a full bricolage of methods and methodologies to make learning work in whatever way works best for the students that are in front of them. And so our job as researchers is coming in to document and synthesize and understand some of these practices, understand some of the decisions that the educators are making, understand how the students are working, um, how they're functioning, and, and um, engaging with the curriculum, how they're learning. And our aim at the end of this is to develop some kind of pedagogic framework and um, provide some recommendations for policy. So a little introduction to the school, and let me, I'm just going to check my time. I get very excited about these things, I could talk forever. Um, so since we started work, uh, I, in, I'll talk just about the case, the Ontario case and the Ontario school where I'm working. So I'm working in one school, uh, so far, we've collaborated with 11 teachers, so it's not just me, obviously. Um, the research assistants who are involved in this project each uh, work one-on-one -on -one with, with a teacher in their classroom. Um, we, the study began first with um, gathering data through surveys, interviews, focus groups with educators, administrators, policymakers. And then drawing upon some of the themes that we identified, we then went into classrooms for two years of field work uh, to learn and see um, about the perceptual data. So uh, to experience for ourselves 
um, what the educators are discussing with us, or what they share with us. So uh, we have worked so far with six classes in grade 9 to 12 ELD classrooms, including language, math, integrated arts, and history. We also are working in three accelerated credit program classes for students who are older. This particular uh, educational context is uh, the students are very fortunate in that the school has the resources to offer a program for students from 18 to 21, but this is rare in Canada, I think. Um, a significant proportion of the students have come from Syria, Iran, Iraq, Congo, Palestine, Colombia, and El Salvador. And again, to illustrate a little bit about um, who the students are, so you can kind of meet the students with me. I want you to get a sense of them. Um, so I, I selected one male and one female student, so Rafat, 17 years old, spent two years living by himself in Sweden en route to Canada, and now is reunited with his family. Uh, and Lely, who um, was working from the age of 13 with her family in the tobacco fields before coming to Canada, uh, she shared with me that she worked six days a week from seven to seven, and that's why she couldn't go to school. But she's very excited about the opportunity to be in school in Canada. Here's um, one of the various kinds of activities we do, or the teachers do, are language portraits. So here's one that one of the students did. Uh, this is from a friend of mine and colleague, Gail Prasad, who, who created this um, outline. It's great. I, I love doing this with students, not only students that I'm doing research with, but also classes that I teach to. I'm sure you've all kind of done this kind of thing. So in terms of an analytic framework for the data, one of the things that uh, I've been playing with to help to synthesize and understand the data that we're collecting is that adapting uh, Nancy Hornberger's continua of biliteracy for thinking about translanguaging classrooms. And so I'll just share this with you and then we'll dig into the data to look at, at how we might apply this analytic framework or what it's helping us to see. So um, if we think about translanguaging pedagogies, and let's separate pedagogy from practice because you know, translanguaging practice is just what we do. It's how we language, or how we might describe how we language. Um, and translanguaging pedagogy is a pedagogy that is planned that we purposefully do in classrooms. So how do we think about harnessing um, the space, the, the people in the room, to engage in a pedagogy that is can be characterized as translanguaging pedagogy. And also, thinking about pedagogy, not just teaching, because teaching might be a more transmission-oriented uh, idea about language versus pedagogy being more this dialogic engagement around education. So um, I, just, I played with Nancy Hornberger's continuum here and put different labels on it, but also all of the labels that exist on the existing um, continuum by literacy are helpful. I like the idea of the continua because it, there is no end point. These are not fixed locations, places we need to stop or start from. They can keep going and they change. And um, when we teach, of course, we are always dynamic and we're always shifting depending on what is happening in the classroom. And so I like this, the movement that this matrix might imply. So when we're thinking about developing translanguaging pedagogy or planning it, we might think about, let's start maybe with the teacher and student initiated. So sometimes the educator will start translanguaging themselves. So that student, they create a context for student initiated translanguaging. Or maybe, I think in a lot of classrooms, like even the university classrooms where I teach, um, if I'm teaching only in English, sometimes students start doing work in other languages. And I would call that student-initiated translanguaging. So we have both. Sometimes it starts with the teacher, sometimes with the students. Sometimes it is spontaneous, and sometimes it is planned. Uh, and sometimes language is used as, let's start with a scaffold for learning. So where we are using one's home language uh, to learn English or um, as a support, and sometimes we're just using it as a resource to go deeper or to uh, expand our thinking or be more creative. So I thought this was helpful for thinking about what we are seeing in um, 
the classrooms where I will show you in a moment. Uh, and I love this idea um, of, and, and by the way, not all of the, these, there are other authors who are writing about these things. Um, Samuels and Gorder have, have written about this. Uh, Jones, um, it's just escaping my mind right now, but have, have talked especially about the spontaneous and planned trans language. So that's, that's out there in the literature already. But I love um, Piet van Evermaa and colleagues in Belgium have written about this idea of valorizing students' cultural and linguistic identities. I like that word here that, that we can really, um, we're not just drawing on them, we're not just engaging them, we are indeed valorizing and upholding. And it, it has a little more power for me. And I know also Enrica Picardo has talked a little bit about catalyzing um, different kinds of learning through plurilingual pedagogies, and I, I like this perspective too. Okay, so let's um, dig into the data. I think I picked, because I thought I had a whole hour, I mean, because I have a whole hour, I picked eight uh, pieces of data to share, and we'll see how, how many I can get through. Um, so, um, I wanted to illustrate for you the, when you walk into these classrooms, it is fully a translanguaging space in that there are many different languages being used. There is every kind of technology being engaged with. Uh, students are constantly working with multiple modes, multiple languages that are their own or other students' languages. Many of the students are multilingual, and their oral language capabilities are incredible. They're very um, great with, with how, they can, how they speak in their home languages and so on. Writing is harder, and when we've tried to do different kinds of writing in their home language activities, it's, it's um, more difficult because they may not have been educated in, in that language. Um, and because they have moved and lived in many, uh, in, in some cases, three different national contexts, they're used to uh, their oral language in, in different languages where the, or in different contexts has really developed as they have um, engaged with these new living circumstances. So just to illustrate, um, this student here, this is very typical. There are smartphones beside every student, and it would be impossible to not have students use phones. It would be almost ridiculous, because it is such a cognitive resource for us. It's distributed cognition. And this picture really illustrates what's happening here. This student is uh, writing, that we're doing a, an investigation around community and home, the idea of home and place. So um, he's writing in English, which is the language he feels most comfortable writing in. Um, he's, use, he's using the Oxford Picture Dictionary to look up some words. And what was great about this, this class, I, was, I took this picture, is we were doing this activity, and the students were not using the Picture Dictionary, interestingly, I think because of their age. Um, they really love translating on their phones. And so he had looked up, he wanted to write about that communities need auto repair shops, and so he looked at auto repair. He was using the speech to text, sorry, text to speech functions. So his phone is saying the word, pronouncing the word, he's repeating the word. Um, he was using an iPad to look at a map of communities and to name the things he was seeing. So he had that visual. Um, to describe what a community needs. But then the Oxford Picture Dictionary came in because the students were just working, and there's a stack of them that often sits, you know, sometimes unused in a classroom, but one of the students at the table came and brought three dictionaries for everybody because he realized that he remembered that the Picture Dictionary has great, um, you know, streetscapes, and it labels all the, all the streets and, and what's happening in a community, and it's, it's actually a really good resource. So he found it, and he shared it with his classmates. The teacher didn't suggest this. Uh, the teacher didn't tell them to use their phones and didn't tell them to, to use the um, voice uh, function. That's very typical. And this student, unfortunately, and this was from the history class, she actually got in trouble because she was using the um, voice um, function on Google Translate to say these English words for some history work she was doing around Remembrance Day and um, the First World War, um, and the teacher told her to turn it off because it was too loud or to put headphones in. But, but they are just doing this, no one told them. So when we're talking about what is student initiated, that's what that looks like. And especially I think what's great when you're working with youth versus a lot of my research has been done at the elementary level. At the elementary level, smaller children don't do this. 
but to work with a teenager, and I have teenage kids, to separate them from their phones is, is just impossible. So this, you can't teach without this. They bring it, and very wonderfully and creatively. Um, and I just, to again, help you meet the students, I have a little voice clip of where I was working with this student, and um, unfortunately I, I forgot the notebook where I had him write down a word that he was teaching me in Arabic. Uh, and I can't remember now which, what it, what the word meant. It's in my notebook, but um, he wanted me to pronounce the word, and he he's teaching me how to um, pronounce it. So I'm just gonna play it for you. It's just a short, short. The two, the two. And I just wanted to say, so you'll hear me say at the beginning, say it again, because. I wasn't recording it at the beginning. I don't always record everything in the classroom. It's just when something happens. So I say, say it again, and he's, he starts again teaching me. But I just say that to clarify that it was, um, he just started. Oh, what's the difference? And English, no, uh, ha and ha. Just, just in English, just ha. Yeah. No, ha. Ha, ha. Different. Ha and ha. And what's the meaning? Is uh, oh, just the pronunciation? Yeah. A, B, C, D. Okay. Ha. Ha. I got it? And what's this word? Say ha. 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 And what's this you word again? Ha, ha. Yeah, so he's, you might not hear it, but he's saying almost and say it. He was really pushing me because he wanted not me just to be helping him. He wanted to be helping me too. And that's very typical in, in the class. So, okay. So another example of how things are teacher and student initiated. Uh, in this case, Ms. Uh, L said to the students, uh, here they were doing something around housing, write a jumla about your house, do 10 jumlas, write the jumlas here. That means sentence, you can infer that that means sentences and it's in Arabic, which I'll, that will come up later on the slide. But so the teacher in providing this instruction said that orally, but she's not an Arabic speaker, but she has learned this from the students, obviously. And then the student, the student, in doing the work, wrote in Arabic herself, but that was not part of the instructions. That's just a strategy that as, as children are older, they just naturally do that, of course. And then when I asked the teacher about it, she said, Jumla, Lupta, it's a joke with us, but it's also a reminder. Lupta, is a, she's talking about putting a period at the end of a sentence. And then another teacher who works in that classroom, when I was asking them about their own uh, use of other languages, this teacher shared that she uses her home language, Urdu, with one of the students in the class and broken Arabic with others so that students in the class can connect with her. Um, so there's also some affective purposes. So sometimes we're using language for, uh, again, scaffolding or as a resource and, and sometimes for affective purposes. And again, I think as language teachers ourselves, none of this is really surprising, right? But um, it's good to see. Um, we also had, I very much, language becomes an object of analysis in the classroom all the time. Um, and in this case, the whole class was reading an adapted version of Jack London's story, The Wolf. And um, the teacher was saying, how do you say paw in Syrian? And Amar, Amar says, Dalsar, it's hard to say in Syrian. I'll try to find an easy word for you. And he uses Google Translate on his phone. But then also, in addition to Google Translate, students very much go over to Google Images and they verify their translation. So this is a strategy that is very effective for them. And he says, Kadam, you can write Kadam. And Mr. G says, no, it's Kur. In my language, Punjabi, it's Kur. All the languages are derived from one. We use Kitab, uh, now meaning book, in Persian, Urdu, Arabic. So he, and then he starts to write uh, what he's talking about on the board. And the student picks up on this metalinguistic inquiry and, and the language families that the teacher is referring to. And he extends this to talking about 
uh, barbecue, kebab is barbecue, it's the same with my people, it's the same. And this inspires a little debate with uh, another student in the class, no that's meat, no it's barbecue, and he says, well barbecue is the same. And then we come back to book, kitab meaning book, kitab is closer to kitaba, which is writing. So um, this is just a very natural part of the classrooms at, at all times. So just stepping back from language and seeing it as this object of inquiry. And, and I guess what I like here, and uh, my colleague Sunny Lau, I think who you may have met, is part of this group, are, and I are talking about how um, in language teaching, from a translanguaging perspective and doing translanguaging pedagogy, we are almost working with students as critical, ethno critical linguistic ethnographers. Um, they are becoming sociolinguists in the classroom with us. And that is a, a different way to position students, not just as learners and receiving um, language teaching, but inquiring about language together. And, and maybe that's another way of looking at things. Um, Ophelia Garcia and others have written about recently about translanguaging stance. Um, and stance, this translanguaging stance referring to um, a view of language that accepts and welcomes and supports all of these, class, these practices in the classroom. And very much uh, speaking with this teacher, actually it was the same teacher who did the discussion about the PAW. Um, we can see in many ways that his perspective is aligned with what we might call or identify as a translanguaging stance. He recognizes that students need to be encouraged in the classroom. If they're not encouraged, if they're not content, they're not going to learn. He also shares that students need to be able to express themselves the way they want to. And that he, he sees language as part of the expertise that the students in the class have. And he sees their language not as a deficit, but certainly as an asset to his classroom, the expertise that they are bringing. So I would certainly call this um, a translanguaging stance. Not all of the teachers in the project so overtly um, describe having this stance, but I think it, it's present in the school and it's present in the classrooms and um, it's, it's varied, the, the, the extent to which people might describe language in the same way but this teacher was particularly articulate about it. Um, thinking about using language as a scaffold and a resource for disciplinary learning in the so-called content areas, um, if we want to talk about not just language as content, um, in the math class, students are also using, um, or the teachers are also creating spaces for students to use their home languages. Um, so in this class, students were, the ultimate goal was to work on calculations. So just the math, that, that's what the teaching, that's what the curriculum says. Is the students need to learn this, oh, I guess maybe I have a, no, this is what is in the curriculum, working on this mathematical thinking. But how are we teaching this mathematical thinking? How are we teaching these concepts? Um, the teacher is very much connecting with who the students are, their resettlement and integration needs, and uh, the resources that they are bringing to the classroom. So to learn those calculations, they are calculating the distance of a trip that they're going to take. Oh, and look at it, it's, from, it's to Montreal, <laughs> actually. Um, so they had to calculate this uh, on the graphic organizer. The teacher has planned already for students to be using multiple languages to scaffold the activity. Um, she does some language teaching. So again, this is a math teacher at the secondary level, teaching the, the um, using language in a disciplinary way. So talking about, um, you know, license, at, well, actually that's not disciplinary, that's not really, that's more general, um, but say depreciation and so on in the context of talking about driving and travel and math. Um, so, the students had to learn these concepts first to do that activity, that they had to learn the language concepts. And then they got to choose what car they wanted to drive. And what was interesting is the different cars have different fuel consumption um, rates. 
And so the, um, this one, the Range Rover or Land Rover was like the really popular one, but each student could only pick one car. So you had to choose which was your car and that was the one you were calculating uh, the cost of your trip to Montreal with. Um, oh yes, and then also the students used Google Maps to map out the, the trip. And another part of the activity, which is not uh, shown here, is that they had to then compare what was the cheapest way to get to Montreal. So they had to think about, they had to calculate bus tickets and train tickets and fuel costs and decide which way they were going to use to get to Montreal. Uh, in a similar kind of teaching that was authentic and meaningful and relevant, um, another um, teacher, also in math, was teaching financial literacy. And again, when we think about these are the curricular concepts, but how are we teaching? What is our pedagogy? What kind of, what do we have to imagine it to be? This teacher was incredibly creative in what she came up with. So the students learn how to withdraw money from an ATM. That's par actually part of the class. And then to mimic that idea of withdrawing money and having money, et cetera, uh, the students were given an allowance and checks by the teacher. They had to balance a checkbook and balance a budget and build a house. Um, but in order to build the house, they had to rent the equipment and they had to buy the materials from the teacher to build their house. And then they had to calculate it all here. Um, and to do all of this, again, uh, they had the math teacher is teaching the language concepts that are associated with this disciplinary learning or that is important. And this is, you know, as language teachers, we, probably, we all know this placemat activity that's very um, popular, the English word, word in another language, a picture, and then use the word in a sentence. So again, for math teaching, this is um, wonderful what the teachers are doing on their own. This is not us doing, telling them to do. So if we step back and summarize for a moment a couple things. Um, if we say, well then what, what comprises translanguaging pedagogy? What, what would we call it? What are the ingredients that make up this pedagogy? Uh, here are some things uh, that um, we have some emerging consensus on. In the literature that we can see in these classrooms, one is this asset-oriented stance, this translanguaging stance that teachers need. Two is making space for the spontaneous translanguaging and also teacher-led translanguaging. Again, using language as a scaffold and a resource. Developing language awareness and metalinguistic inquiry. Uh, connecting with social constructivist learning tasks. And also thinking about disciplinary ways of using language. So students be become apprenticed in particular disciplinary literacies. So this, this is a good place. We could stop here and say this is enough for our translanguaging classrooms. Um, but what was interesting is this wasn't all that was going on in the classrooms. There was more that, we, um, that, that helps to push us beyond this. And so I want to share a couple other pieces that I think this, this tends to stay in the functional realm. This isn't, maybe this is critical. Maybe we, we would call this a critical pedagogy, but is it really? Um, so I want to offer two other things that help us to think about how translanguaging pedagogy, particularly with youth who have been displaced, as a necessity must also be taking a much more critical stance. And this comes from the data, not just, of course, I already think that way um, in theories and in things that I read, but from the data itself, um, we could see that, that there's more that we need to attend to and engage with. And we look carefully. So this was from that, going back to that activity around communities um, and mapping and what is in a community. Um, one of the culminating tasks was that students needed to plan their own city. And this was what this student's culminating task looked like. Uh, this was the city he planned. And then he wrote about different aspects about his city and a couple things I want to share with you. And when I worked with him, um, we could talk a little bit more about. So one of the things that was really notable, the blue arrows, I put that on here. Most of the students in the class just put like one bus stop in their, this little map that they were doing. But this student put six. So this was really different. So I wanted to ask him about his six bus stops. 
And um, when we talked and took some time to engage, he discussed how important it is to get around a city quickly and efficiently. And he shared um, with me that when you have to wait a long time, when you, know, when you don't have a car and when the place where you live is, is distant from the city center and so on, this affects how you participate in a city. And so he really felt this and he talked about how it takes him an hour to get to school and an hour to get home. And that's time that he's not spending with his family or working on homework and so on. And he, he really talked about how um, important it was to have access to different resources and for him transportation was part of that access. And I really saw this as his own critical thinking about um, that not everybody has the same access to transportation in the city. Um, this also came up in other parts of their writing too where um, students, for example, I think here, um, students, I think he talked about um, having a police station. And police stations were, were very present uh, in, in the cities that they planned because of feeling safe and also, a lot of the students really talked about having both churches and mosques in their cities. And so thinking about their own needs, but also thinking about other people's uh, religious practices as well. And I think th these are some of the critical thinking that the students are engaged in. And when we're teaching in a way that doesn't, that can quickly overlook these things and just get to the, the end of the task, there, were, there was stuff that we could dig deeper into, uh, concepts that we could explore um, in a more engaged fashion that that uh, the teachers and I are working on this year. Um, also, the students very much had their own social justice identifications that came from their own lived experiences. And again, when we slowed down and saw this in their work and took the time to get to know them and took the time to talk to them about their experiences, it was evident. But you could also teach in such a way that you could sail right over these things too, uh, because there's lots of things that need to be done in, in the classroom. Um, so this was from um, students who were working on writing their CV and in, in looking at this student's CV, and again I put that blue square there, um, he was, so himself is a person who has been displaced and who is living uh, in a, a low socioeconomic area in uh, Ontario and you know, he, his family might be described as in need of things that other families don't have, but when he's writing about his own experience, he's writing about himself helping others. And I think this is really important for how students are positioned, just because they may be uh, identified as refugees at present, doesn't mean they are not also uh, helping others, that they don't also um, see these aspects of our world and, and the ways in which um, we live and experience uh, material circumstances that are um, beyond our control and how they participate in these spaces. So just because students maybe uh, can't write about this in, in whatever language and just because they may not be able to articulate this uh, in the same way as their same age peers doesn't mean it's not happening. But what was very interesting when I brought these pieces of data to the teachers, um, so we had at various times we have uh, we come together and we reflect on the data and analyze it together. Um, I shared these pieces with the teachers and um, it was really interesting that this educator who very much has a social justice stance in her teaching, she shares at the bottom here, I do, oops, she says, I do this in all of my classes except ELD. So that was very interesting that maybe because of the language and literacy practices or, or for other reasons that we're still exploring, uh, she doesn't necessarily start with this idea of thinking about students' social justice orientations and identifications and their capabilities for uh, seeing themselves as people with power. And so how might we add that when we're thinking about translanguaging pedagogy, how do we make sure that translanguaging pedagogy is not just technical, it's not just instrumental, but it is about um, teaching in ways that help people to be seen as those with power and those who can make a difference. So um, all of this to me brings me to think about this, going back to these theoretical 
ideas in our field around the access paradox and additive bilingualism versus translanguaging and um, how some of these perspectives can rub uncomfortably, sit uncomfortably against one another and how educators uh, deal with this in their classrooms. Because often when I present work around translanguaging to educators or to uh, teacher candidates and so on, they, they talk about, well, how can I do this in my classroom when I'm supposed to be teaching English? This is, a, this is probably the first comment I hear from teachers often when I'm, when I'm presenting things. So we can, we, this has been named, Hilary Jenks calls this the access paradox. Um, and the, the difficulty in, in both delivering access to the dominant language um, without raising critical awareness and critical literacy. We have to do these things together. And also, what, what is the paradox associated with ignoring or stigmatizing students' funds of knowledge? And how, do, how are we implicated in, in reifying particular linguistic hierarchies and monolingual ideologies when we are trying to address students' material need to learn English at the same time? Um, and how are we contributing to or questioning or challenging the construction of difference between expected performances of bilingualism in the classroom and outside of the classroom? in our communities, which are multilingual. And to what extent are we imposing particular subject positions, like that other educator said, where she, she realized that she was starting, she was imposing a particular position of students as subordinate or remedial or in need, and particularly when we're working with uh, persons who have been displaced. And so moving from a pragmatic, thank you, um, a pragmatic, translanguaging pedagogy to one that is critical, so critical translanguaging pedagogy. So then we might add to that list that I had before of what is a translanguaging classroom to me from a critical perspective, um, and I think to many others as well, it's also about raising critical consciousness and awareness, challenging linguistic hierarchies, and countering the reproduction of settler colonial relations in our classrooms. Um, and the other thing that I just want to add about for working with these youth, when we talk about borders, like, and I, I think in applied linguistics, some of these questions around language are really about these borders between how we are defining languages and languages between borders. When I work with these youth, what I see is students who have already successfully traversed, negotiated, um, navigated borders, state borders. Uh, and that we, that I can't even relate to, I, I have, I can't, I have, I don't have the same experience, but I see that they have transcended and navigated these borders. So when we think then about a pedagogy and a way of thinking about language that also transcends these borders, I see that as very aligned. And to me, this, the partic working with this particular site, these teachers and students, it's a wonderful space to be asking questions about translanguaging, translanguaging pedagogies, or plurilingual pedagogies, plurilingualism, uh, depending on um, what we are, how we are approaching it. Um, so just to conclude, thank you to our research assistants. Here's some of them building some of those houses with the roofs on it. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. And that's it. I look forward to the discussion and questions.